gracious words. <laughs> Praise God. Is that my drink, is it? It's very, very nicely set out. Thank you. That's because you didn't do that to him. Wasn't it? That's right. <laughs> Can we do anything with this mic, Jamie? Or is that... <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It really is. Um, I've known Jamie and Mel for, well, I've known Jamie for about 15 years. And um, I remember when he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was so hungry, so thirsty. You wish you could see a bit more of that today, you know, sometimes. But he was so hungry and thirsty for God, and it, he just got instantly filled and I remember within minutes he was he was prophesying right into all sorts of situations it was incredible to see when we took on our first church um, in Winsford Jamie came to to do the youth and I can remember at the time we were living in this house we'd taken in um, a homeless guy called Steve who was living with us we got our own kids obviously Mandy my wife we had a young African guy called Percy. I had, there was nine of us. And there was just, the house absolutely stank. And uh, the, the, can you remember, Jamie, that rancid smell of, of bad feet? <laughs> You've never smelled anything like it. But it wasn't Jamie. <laughs> but I have to say, back then, he, he lit up our church. He came and he really... Jamie has got a unique sense of humor, and he brought it into the church, and I thank God for Jamie and Mel. They were, they were tremendous for us, a real encouragement. And when they moved on to uh, Biddulph, I was gutted, but I knew it was the right thing for them. You know, you can only take people so far, and I believe this is their time. Uh, and you guys, this is, this, is, this is your time together for something really special to happen. And so I, quite a few months ago, I believe the Lord gave me this word for, for Jamie and, and Mel. It is, uh, it is induction. So, um, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for these, um, these special times in our lives, Lord. We ask now, Spirit of the living God, come, Lord, come and speak as your word goes forth. Speak into our hearts. Speak into our lives, Lord. If there are those here, Lord, that are discouraged, maybe going backwards, Lord, I pray, my God, that you would help them and strengthen them. Lord, I pray for Jamie and Mel in particular today. And I ask, my God, Lord, you would give this man a double portion of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, he came to a very important road called the Appian Road, the Appian Way, going into Rome. He was imprisoned, and he knew his end had come. And so he wrote a letter to his beloved Timothy. He was handing over the baton to the next generation, and he charged Timothy with these words. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Preach the word. Paul didn't say preach postmodernism. He didn't say preach that which is politically correct or that which won't offend people today. He said preach the word. And friends, God has never changed. It's written right there. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the word of God today in 2013 carries the same power and the same anointing as it's ever done before. And Paul charged the next generation, preach the word. You know, it's said of the evangelical fundamental churches in America that only 3% today have a midweek Bible study. 3%. Friends, if the word is not central, and I know Jamie's very central to the word, you may as well shut your doors. But the Apostle Paul said, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. 
whether it's fashionable or unfashionable. I believe today, with this new generation, it is becoming conspicuous by its absence in, in, in many meetings. But the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage. Paul was saying to Timothy, the word of God is the best counselling tool you'll ever have as a pastor. Use the word to correct, use the word to rebuke and use the word to encourage people. Don't try and do it yourself because we're subjective and very often we're insecure and sometimes when we counsel we mess up. Paul says use the word of God to correct, to rebuke, to encourage with great patience, careful instruction for the time will come and friends the time has come. The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge your duties as a minister. And then Paul says this. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed his appearing. Paul wrote these words on the Appian Way, a straight way, the most ancient road in Rome. The road that was used for the Roman armies to go out and conquer the nations. In a prison right on this way, he wrote these words. Thirty years earlier, the Apostle Paul, known as Saul. Saul means... The requested one. The man that's in demand. And Saul changed his name from Saul to Paul, which means small, little. And there was this man by the name of Saul, trained under Rabbi Gamaliel, part of the Sanhedrin. This man knew where he was going. He was full of ambition and he believed himself, I believe, to be the next Gamaliel, the next big shot in Jerusalem. And he saw Christianity as a cult that must be extinguished. He saw Jesus Christ as a man that died pathetically upon the cross, never to raise again. And he saw Christianity as the most dangerous cult in the world. And he took it upon himself that he would be the one that would extinguish the world of Christianity, this dangerous sect. And of course, at the end of all that, Saul, the requested one, would take all the glory. And so he sees the first Christian martyr, Stephen, being stoned to death. And Stephen cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I believe at that point, something happened in this rapacious wolf, Saul, when he realized that Christians were able to forgive in the most extreme circumstances. It drove him over the edge. And he began to persecute Christians. And he got letters from the high priest to go as far as the most ancient city in the world, Damascus. And off he went. To extinguish Christianity. He believed he was absolutely right. Even though at the time. Jesus knew he was kicking against the will of God. This man was convinced in his heart. He was the man. And so off he went. To Damascus. And suddenly the Bible says he saw a great light. And he heard a voice. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? Who are you, God? And the voice said, I am Jesus. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. And Saul was a man of 
destiny and vision and action. So even then he said, what do you want me to do for you, Lord? And Jesus says, I want you to go to the street called Straight in Damascus. And there you'll receive instruction. 30 years ago, Saul was told to go to the street called Straight. Friends, God, our Lord Jesus, saves people. It doesn't matter whether they are of the highest class or the lowest class. It doesn't matter whether they're incredibly intellectual or ridiculously simple. It doesn't matter what colour skin they have. It doesn't matter what amount of sin they've done. Our Jesus saves people from sin. That's what he does. He is the saviour of the world and there is only one. And Saul, on the way to Damascus, finally realised who Jesus really was and more importantly than that, that he was alive and that death could not hold him. He says, go to the street called Straight. And friends, our Lord... The first thing that he does when he saves a person is he straightens them out. Mm -hmm. He straightens them out. He says, you've got to go to the street called Straight. And there, listen to me. And friends, I believe that our God is the God and the only one that can straighten somebody out. He's been straightening you out. He's been straightening me out. And he can straighten out the worst sinner. Now, I believe that Saul's problem was not immorality. He was not an immoral man as such. He was a man of great standing. But he did have a problem and he admitted to it. And his problem was he was very ambitious. And so he gets to Damascus. And he's anointed by a man called Ananias. And suddenly like scales fell off his eyes. And he realises that Jesus, this Jesus, whom he's been persecuting, is actually the Messiah of the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament. He can't wait. Ananias comes to him and he says, Saul, God's told me what your mission is going to be to the Gentiles. And Saul didn't want that, friends. He wanted to be the top man to the Jews. He wanted to be the new Rabbi Gamaliel. But God says, no, that's not for you. I've got for you a completely different calling, Saul. I want you to go to the dogs. I want you to go to the nations that you think are the dogs. That's my calling for you. So off. Saul goes. He gets up. He goes into Damascus. He goes to the first synagogue. He goes to the Jews. And he tries to start to prove that Jesus is the Christ of the Jews. Even though he's been told. You have to go to the Gentiles first. And it doesn't work for him. And so he has to go to Arabia. He actually goes to Mount Sinai for something like three years. He is a man that's motivated by action. He's a doer. He's a Martha. He's not a Mary that sits by Jesus. He wants to do, do, do. And God sends him to Mount Sinai to learn of God, to sit at the feet of God and just to spend time with God alone. Listen, friends. Our God is more interested in you than what you can do for him. Do you know that? He says in Isaiah, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What temple can you make for me? He says, this is the one to whom I will look. The one who is humble and who trembles at my word. And I believe those three years that the Apostle Paul spent at that time in the wilderness, everybody has to go in the wilderness, and even Paul did. I believe during that time he learnt to rely on God. He learnt that the most important thing in his life was to love the Lord. And so after three years he comes out of the wilderness, full of the power of the Spirit. Right, I'm going to give you another crack. I'm going back to Damascus. I'm going to show them that Jesus is the Christ. So he goes back to the Jews again in Damascus. Starts to proclaim that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies. And they don't like him. (laughs) They they actually don't like him. And he can't understand why. And they say, look, we have to lower you out of a basket. You're not wanted. So there he is, three years later, things still aren't working out for the 
poor guy. Eventually he moves down to Jerusalem. He thinks, well, mate, this is where I am, this is where I come from, this is where I should be. So he gets down to Jerusalem. And a great guy, and we all need these fellas, they're called Barnabas's sons of encouragement. Barnabas comes to him and says, you know what, I don't think you're as bad as you look. You come with me, I'll introduce you to Peter, to John, and to James. Follow me, I'll get you in. So off he goes to see Peter, John, and James, and they're a little bit like this. Not sure about this guy. Uh, well, you know, And that's what it was like for Paul at that time. And so eventually, folks, get this. He had to go back home. And so this great man of God that had been baptised in the Holy Spirit that knew the scriptures inside out, had to go into the wilderness for three years, came back, went to Jerusalem, thought that it was going to happen, and they just simply said, go home, Paul. <laughs> and here, you want to know when the salt really rubbed into the wound? He went home for about seven to ten years. And while that happened, the book of Acts said that churches in Jerusalem enjoyed a great time of peace and really began to grow. <laughs> The only way things would work for Saul at that time in his life is when he wasn't there. <laughs> By this point, Saul had been saved for around about 14 years. 14 years, my friend. And I say that because I believe there's always a time of preparation. There's always a time when God changes us from the requested one. To small, to poor, to little, to the least of the apostles. And so he'd gone away. He was a tent maker, but I, I believe that this man was absolutely in love with God. I believe that this man was utterly devoted to God and was ready at any time to serve the Lord. Well, all those years go by. I've known Jamie for about the same period of time. And I've seen Jamie at his lows. We all have lows. I've seen him at his high. I've seen him with his fabulous sense of humour. I've seen him doing the most stupendous dramas you have ever seen. I've seen his preaching going from fairly okay to dynamic. And I believe, like the Apostle Paul, it took 15 years. Friends, there's nothing wrong with preparation. Nothing whatsoever. And so, that's just the introduction, Jeremy. <laughs> and so... You're on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a man that was ready. He comes back to Jerusalem. Barnabas goes looking for him. I reckon Barnabas was thinking, do you know what? Antioch is perfect for this guy. This is where he should be. So he brings him to Antioch. This is where you should be, son. So he comes to Antioch. And one year passes by, and I believe Paul and Barnabas were the best buddies. You got a best buddy in the ministry? got somebody that you can trust with with all your heart. That was Paul and Barnabas. They love one another. A year goes by. They're in a normal prayer meeting. You know those box standard ones in the midweek that nobody comes to? It was that. And they were praying. And then this voice says, separate for me, Paul and Barnabas, for the ministry that I have for. I can imagine them pair looking at one another. Glee! Just full of... This is it! This is it, mate! We're going! <laughs> so... That's it, the church lays hands on them, and off they go to Barnabas' home place, Cyprus. And they get us, now Cyprus was dark. Cyprus at that time was so dark that every woman on that island had to do one year of temple prostitution. That's how dark it was. And Paul and Barnabas went to that island to proclaim, there is a God that can forgive all sin. There is a son that died upon the cross, and they went through Cyprus. And the governor of Cyprus, the most influential man in Cyprus, Sergius Paulus, said, you know what, I want to hear what these guys have got to say. And they're drawn to the most important man on the island. But there's this guy called Bar-Jesus. He's the enlightened one. He doesn't like it. Jamie, I'm sorry to say there are times, even when you're on the move, that there's resistance. <laughs> now here's a man, Paul, broken, broken man. But it's come his time. And he turns round to this imposter, 
trying to put the governor off the gospel. And he says this, you son of the devil, how long will you preserve the ways of your life? Turn up, look at me. <laughs> your time, you're going to be blind. <laughs> Does that sound like a broken man to you? Well, let me tell you, friends, and this is the whole point of this sermon. I hope you, you get it. When you weak, you are utterly strong. Yeah. And so, at that point, the Holy Spirit points out Paul as the leader. So. Barnabas anymore, it's Paul. From that moment on, it's always Paul and Barnabas, not Barnabas and Paul. That's what happened. Something else happened at that point. Barnabas brought along his uh, nephew, John Mark, and at that point, John Mark, perhaps because now Paul was the guy that was in charge, he decides to turn back, and he goes back home. We don't know why he went back home, really, but he bottled it, and he went back. Paul and Barnabas go on to Turkey and they get to Turkey and they begin to preach the gospel. And folks, it was like a gospel bomb went off in Turkey. They began, Paul began to preach like he'd never preached before and they couldn't get enough of the grace of God. But there was always opposition and so they moved on to the next place and he began to preach again and there was opposition again. And finally, the Jews and jealous people stirred up a rebel to stone Paul to the point of death. This was his first missionary journey. His first missionary journey ended up where Paul was literally left for dead. He would have been battered beyond recognition. And I believe, friends, it was at that time that Paul was caught up to the third heaven and he heard things inexpressible, unlawful to be said. This was a man that understood the gospel better than any other man in the New Testament. That was his first gospel mission. He gets back home and he reflects for five years. You ever feel like it's not happening for you? Do you ever feel like somehow you're stuck in no man's land? Do you know that no time is wasted in God whatsoever? And after five years, Paul says to Barnabas, we need to go back and strengthen these churches. And so off they go. And they're going along the way. And Paul says to Barnabas, there's just one thing. John Mark, he can't come. He's bottled it. And Barnabas says, you're kidding. He's family. He's my family. And family sticks together. And Paul says, family's got nothing to do with this. This is the kingdom of God we're talking about. And Paul had a very wide view of the kingdom. And Barnabas had a very narrow view. Barnabas saw people. Paul saw the big picture. Who was right and who was wrong? Well, Paul was the guy that was in charge on this mission. And Barnabas and Paul, I want you to get this, folks, this is church. This is Christianity at its best. On the second missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, best buddies, best mates, could tell one another anything, had such a <coughs> sharp dispute, they went their separate ways. And Barnabas went off with his nephew and Paul took a man called Silas and off they went on their missionary journey. And I believe something happened to Paul at that time. Because Paul tried after that to go one way. And the Holy Spirit said, no, Paul. He tried to go another way. And the Holy Spirit said, no, Paul. I can imagine Paul at that time thinking, is it because of this split? Is it because of the, me and my best friend in the ministry have had such a row? God isn't speaking to me. Let me tell you, this is all part of the ministry. It happens and so off they go. And I believe Paul began to cry out to God, God, what's happened? What's wrong? And he sees a vision of a man from Macedonia, Europe. And the man from Macedonia says, come over here and help us. Paul says, guys, come on, pack your bag. Get on the ship, we're going. The Bible says at once they went. I can imagine Paul on that ship saying to the lads, 
get to the front of the ship, when we get to the port, you look for a man waving like this, saying, come over here and help us. Would you do that? I would. You'll see a man. I'll see him. I'll tell you what he looks like. And you'll see him doing that. So they get to the other side, but there is no man from Macedonia. He's not there. And Paul does what Paul does. He goes looking for a synagogue, can't find one, goes to the river and finds some lovely ladies just praying. One lady <coughs> called Lydia, a very wealthy lady, gave her heart to the Lord. I wonder if she was the man from Macedonia. I can imagine Paul thinking, praise the Lord, but where's this man from Macedonia? And then around about that time, there was a fortune teller slave woman that was making <coughs> some people a lot of serious brass. And she was doing this. These are the men of the Most High God <laughs> proclaiming to you the way of the Lord. Now, actually, if somebody said that to me, I'd say, yeah, praise the Lord, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> but this went on for days. These are the men of the Most High God proclaiming to you the way of the Lord. And f let me tell you something, Jamie. Another thing that you're going to have to watch is flattery. <laughs> it happens. And so after two or three days, Paul lets this go on. And he realizes, actually, this is not coming from God. This is coming from Satan. So he rebukes this woman. She loses her power. The people that made money off her lose the money. And Paul and Silas find themselves publicly flogged. Where's the man from Macedonia? This was the second missionary journey. Tries to go one way, doesn't work. Tries to go the other way, doesn't work. Cries out to God, God, show me. Come over here and help us. They just get flogged. And the Bible says that Paul ends up in the deepest prison. Locked away with Silas. At midnight. I wonder which one started first. <laughs> this was your fault. <laughs> oh, it's the leader alone. But they start to pray. They start to pray and they start to encourage one another. And they start to sing. And the Bible says this. The prisoners in that place heard Paul and Silas singing. And when the prisoners heard Paul and Silas singing... The Bible says there was an earthquake and the prison doors flung open. And the prison captain, the guard, gets a knife and he's just about to kill himself because he's not held them. And he would lose his life for it. And Paul says, I don't want you to do that. And you know what happens. This prison officer and all the prisoners, but the prison officer and his family, Come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the prison officer says. What must I do to be saved? I believe, friends, you can disagree with me, no matter. I believe that the man from Macedonia was the prison officer. And I'll tell you why I believe that. Because things never work out the way you think. They never do. That was Paul's second missionary journey. He goes on from there to Thessalonica. They don't like him much there. There's one person that said, These are the ones that have turned the world upside down. Cart them off. <laughs> so they go on to Berea. The people at Berea treat them with a bit more respect and say, Do you know what? They're actually speaking sense. Jesus is the Messiah. They go on to a place called Corinth. By this time, things are going really well. And Paul's thinking, Hey, up, when things go well for me, Something bad happens. You know, I either get stoned or flogged or something. So Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, do not fear. I have many people in this city. And I believe that's for you, Jamie. God has many people in this city for you. He's got a plan for you. It won't be without his problems. You know that already. But when they come, they will surprise you. <laughs> that's just how it goes. And eventually... Paul finishes his second missionary journey. By this point, he's a seasoned man of God, covered in wounds and scars. Paul, all his life, wanted to go to one place. I'm wrapping up now, mate. <laughs> he wanted to visit this place called Ephesus. And on his third missionary journey, he went to this place called Ephesus. 
And the Bible says this, and this will encourage you, men. The Bible says this, is, this was his strategy in Ephesus. This was the greatest move of the Spirit in the entire New Testament. So here's the strategy. This is what they did. They rented a little hall and they had dialogue with people every day. You got that? <laughs> they, they rented a little hall and had dialogue with people every day. Does that sound like a winning plan? <laughs> and the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord used Paul at that time in an extraordinary manner. And the, the Bible actually says that during that time the word of the Lord was known all the way through Asia Minor. Friends, I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that if God is going to use a person, first he must call them, and he's called you. Secondly, he must break a person. It's unavoidable. We must be broken if we're going to be of any use to God. He must break us. And I believe by this time in Paul's ministry, he was so called, he was so broken, God could use this man inside out and back to front, quite frankly. It didn't really matter what program he used at this point. God was going to bless him mightily. And that's how it is, folks. That's our God. So let me wrap this up. Paul had had a hard life, but he'd had a fantastic life. He'd had a dynamic life. This was his prayer. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his death. That's what I want in my life. There were two places left that he wanted to visit passionately, Jerusalem and Rome. And he said to his friends, he said, I want you to pray that when I go to Jerusalem, one, they'll accept me, that there won't be any problems, and that when I come to you in Rome, I'll come to you refreshed. He got three friends. He said, just really pray into that for me, will you? Yes, we'll pray for you, Paul. We've got it. They'll accept you. There won't be any problems. And when you get to Rome, you'll be you'll go get there really refreshed. So he finally gets to Jerusalem. He has this great big offering for the Paul church in Jerusalem. The Bible never records that there was any thanks whatsoever for that offering. Then he meets up with Peter and James and John. And although Peter and James and John are like, hey, Paul, great to see you, mate. I mean, you've done some mighty things, but... Uh, not sure whether they'll like you around here. I mean, these guys are passionate for the law, and we know what you preach. They, they virtually ripped Paul apart in Jerusalem. He prayed they'd accept him. He prayed things would go well. He ended up in prison for two years. After two years, God spoke to him and said, you will appear before Caesar in Rome. Paul gets on the ship. His last prayer was, pray that when I get to Rome, I'll be refreshed. <laughs> <coughs> he goes to Rome, chained as a prisoner. <coughs> gets towards the Isle of Malta. There's such a dreadful wind, such a dreadful hurricane. Literally, the boat starts falling to pieces. Everybody on that ship panics apart from one person, the Apostle Paul. And Paul said on that ship, chained up, knowing full well that his life was totally in the hands of God, he said, not one person on here will perish. Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were shipwrecked. He gets to the Isle of Malta. They light a fire because they're all cold. Out of the fire comes a snake that latches onto Paul and bites him. When he's been bitten, the natives say, the guy's going to die, just watch, any minute now he's going to drop down dead. An hour later, watch now, any minute he's going to drop down dead. Eventually they realise that Paul didn't drop down dead, he's an anointed man of God, and all of a sudden they're bringing all the sick from Malta to see Paul. Every single time in Paul's life, something that was meant for harm turns out for good. Every time. But here's the thing, folks, it never goes the way you think. It never does. Eventually, Paul sails off from Malta. And gets imprisoned. On it, the most ancient road in the Roman Empire. The first road, thir 30 years earlier, was called the Straight Street. 
Friends, it is unavoidable. There are no shortcuts. You cannot be fast-tracked. God has to straighten us out. He has to. And I believe he's done that with you, mate. And I believe you're ready for something absolutely fantastic. But friends, there comes a point in our life where God says, I want to see how you finish this race. Will you finish this race as well as you started it? And on the Epean Road, the straightest road in Rome, the road that had been built for one reason, for the armies of Rome to go out and to attack, attack and take all the nations. When that road was finished, the creator of that road gave a speech. And in his speech he said, Rome will never be invaded. Can you get this picture? I want you to picture an oldish, bold, knobbly kneed man covered in wounds from head to toe <coughs> going down this road that mighty armies had gone the other way to take nations, a road that had been proclaimed nobody will invade the Roman Empire. And after Paul had visited Rome and stood before Caesar, 200 years later, Christianity had burst the borders of the Roman Empire. And these are the words that Paul says to Timothy in closing. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous one, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who long for his appearing. I believe you're 15 years old, mate. I believe you're on your first missionary journey. And I believe a grenade of grace is going to go off in this place. And many people are going to come to know the Lord. Amen. Amen. Tonight, I'd just like to bring a little bit of a charge to Jamie, but may I remind you, and some of the scriptures which our brothers used, actually, in fact, I had here, but I shall not duplicate them. But we are reminded by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. That it is God that gives any gift to any person. We are only what we are by the grace of God and by his gifting. And we are not all gifted the same way. The Bible talks about the body of Christ and all the different members. But God gives particular gifts to particular people. And I believe that gift has been given to your pastor. God has gifted him for the work of the ministry. And the apostle tells us that the work of the ministry, he spells it out quite clearly, is that it's to prepare God's people for works of service. Not just to keep them comfortable in their seats in church. Not just to make them feel good when they've heard a good piece of ministry like we've heard tonight. But it's to do something to us and in us so that we, he can work through us to, for the enlargement of the kingdom of God. And I believe that your pastor has that gift in order to equip this church for the work of the ministry. There is a big town outside here, which needs to hear the gospel, and your pastor is not going to do it, not on his own. It's up to every single one of us to do something in order to spread the good news of the gospel. We are being prepared by those who preach to us to inspire us 
so that people can have what we have enjoyed for many years, perhaps, or just recently. We I enjoy a good life in the Lord Jesus Christ. If I had my time to start again, I'd do it all over again. And I gave my heart and life to the Lord Jesus when I was just a boy, 12 years of age. I never regretted it and never looked back. I'm 79 now. Some people have been looking on me and asking. I'm 79 now. So it's a long time since I gave my heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But all the ministry which I have sat under has been to encourage me to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. The best way for any church to grow is for one person to tell another. One person to witness to another. That's how churches grow. But we should never take lightly any God-given gift. And we've got to remember the grave responsibility which comes with that gifting. We're all responsible before God on how we use or abuse that gift. And one day, we'll all be answerable when we stand before the Almighty. And all I want to hear is him say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I'm sure that's what you want as well. But the Apostle Paul said this, I thank our Lord Jesus Christ, who has enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Friends, I believe that is what's happened to Jamie. The Lord has counted him faithful, the work he's been doing, to put him into the ministry. And I believe it's God's given gift to you for that. And I believe it is God who placed Jamie Bolton in the ministry in this church. I believe it was God's intervention that brought him to Blackburn. And those who were responsible at that time know what I'm talking about. I believe it's God that brought him to Blackburn. And I charge every member of the Blackburn church to acknowledge and honor that fact that God has brought him here as your pastor. Submit to him and allow him under God's authority and direction to lead you and serve you just as God directs, not by any human direction, but by the direction of the Almighty. And I'm sure God will bless you. Now, I'd just like to say a few words to Jamie, and I would like him to come and stand beside me, if you would, Jamie, please. Now, I want to say this personally to you, my brother. I read it so I will not forget it. It's the words of the Apostle Paul. And as he was talking to the man we've been taught, our brother mentioned, in his ministry too, to young Timothy as he was entering into the ministry, he says this, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience. And I'll tell you, it will test your patience, the <laughs> ministry. With great patience and give careful instruction. The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, the apostle said. And he's absolutely right. That time, I believe, has come. But keep your head in all situations. And that's difficult, too. I've blown my top more than once. <laughs> Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship and do the work of the ministry. Do the work of the evangelist. And discharge all the duties of the ministry. And I charge you in the sight of God and Jesus Christ to keep these instructions without partiality 
and to do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. You understand that, I'm sure. And I'm sure God will bless your ministry in this church. And I would like you to bring your dear wife with you, stand before us. And I want to ask all the ministers who are present with us, would you please come forward, please, and assist me as we lay hands upon this good couple that has set out on this important ministry in this church. after we have prayed for these good folks I want to pray for the family I want to pray for the, the, the little one myself we could just come around and lay hands upon yes. them yes. Yes. Father I pray in the name of Jesus that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit Amen. will come up our brother that he will, Lord, as he searches his own heart, oh. yeah, will find in you, Lord, uh, yeah. that which he needs to know. Mm. That he will, Lord Jesus, as he studies to make himself approved yeah. unto you, yeah. will find that approval yeah. will come uh, when people find Jesus as their Lord and Savior yeah. Yeah. in this place. We believe, Lord Jesus, yeah, that you've sent him here for this particular time. And we pray, oh, Father, that you bless him and his dear oh, wife. Lord, Lord may they be empowered from Amen. the Spirit of God from oh, on high. Yes. Yes. And that we will see, Lord, and oh, be, be able to join in with him in rejoicing Amen. Amen. when we see Amen. many come to the kingdom of God. So bless them, we pray, Amen. and we commit them into your charge. In the name Amen. of our lovely Savior. Amen. 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 I've got a heart for children. I always have had a heart for children. And, uh, you know, I used to have pockets full of lollipops. Uh, <laughs> kids used to come for lollipops. But, you know, in this day and generation, when people look on it as something strange, I have to stop it. <laughs> this is the, 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 the time we live in. Bless you, Pastor. I, I'm in charge of a school in Pakistan with 65 children and have an education. I raise the money for that because I love the children. Bless Jesus for them. My Lord Jesus, bless them. Let them all be found in these lovely children. I pray, Lord, that they just help them that to see mum and dad working in the kingdom of God. That you, Lord, just help them and that they will be crowned with heaven. That you do them here so that you can bless them and the family too. So that a blessing be upon them, I pray. In the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Well, we, and on behalf of my family, we would like to thank you all very much for the ministry that you've given to us today and for the church. We know that that's a word in season and really speaks very much to a lot of what the Lord has done. It's been a difficult time, I know, um, for Grace for a long time here at the church, and we pray a real blessing here from the Lord for them and here. And so we do thank you for all that you've said and all that you've done.